Okay, uh, welcome back. I think the internet is working okay now, so we are back on video. Um, so we'll just continue from there. Did anyone have questions about the last, uh, the last one on the greater sin? You are online or in person? Context from First uh, John five seventeen. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Okay, so that is uh, a different. Uh, a different uh, context, right? Uh, can you repeat the verse, please? Sorry. 1 John 5.17. Okay. Uh, so, um, we'll, I'd, we'd like have to read more in 1 John to... Uh, look at what uh, John is talking about. But uh, in 1 John, John is talking a lot also about wrong teaching about Jesus, uh, mostly uh, that uh, some questions about whether Jesus was God. And so uh, when he's talking about sin, it's that rejection of Jesus as God that leads to death. Uh, in that kind of uh, context is where he's talking about a difference in sin of whether you've done something that is wrong and whether it is also a one-time sin or a continuing in sin, a continuing rejection of God. A continuing rejection of God will lead to death. Uh, but if it is a sin that is a one time and you're repenting of that sin, there is forgiveness for that sin. Um, so... Yeah, that is, but yeah, that is also one of those difficult passages in scripture. Okay, we'll uh, continue. Uh, so the next one is on page 40, forgiving people's sins. Um, John 20, 23 says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Okay? Um, so what does that mean? Uh, do we have the power to forgive people's sins or to choose to withhold forgiveness? Uh, and based on our forgiveness, is their judgment determined? Their judgment by God? Or how do we understand this verse? Okay, so what are some rules about interpreting scripture that we've discussed in this class? When we're looking at a passage like this, how do we make sure we interpret it correctly? Because if we take it by itself, it looks like we can choose to... Uh, we we can determine someone's eternity. We can either forgive them or uh, choose not to forgive them, and their final that decision is placed with us. But what is what do we do? How do we make sure we interpret this passage correctly? Sister, only God can uh, forgive us, and sister. Okay. Uh, how, uh, why do you say that, sister? That only God can forgive sins? Uh, because Jesus said, I have the power to forgive sins. Okay, so you're looking at uh, other parts of scripture uh, where it says that only God can forgive sins, right? Yes, but I don't know the scripture, sister. Okay, okay. The, yes. So uh, one of the, you know, we want to also put into practice some of the things that we've discussed in interpreting scripture uh, in this uh, class. So one of the ways in which we make sure we can interpret this correctly is by looking at other passages of scripture talking about forgiveness, right? So who has the authority to forgive sins? 
so uh, jesus said that he has the authority to forgive sins or uh, when he forgave sins and people questioned him he um, he shows that he has that authority to forgive sins he has the power to forgive sins right um, and uh, people were offended when jesus forgave sins because they said only god can forgive sins but jesus uh, goes ahead and still forgives sins to show that uh, he had that power, which means that he is God. Okay. Any other principles of interpretation that we need to apply here? What other ways can we make sure we don't wrongly interpret this verse? Okay, so apart from looking at the rest of scripture, we look at the immediate context. Okay, so let's turn to John 20. So the first thing to do is when we are looking at a passage is look at the immediate context. Why is the writer saying it? What was happening in that passage? And how does this verse relate to what he was saying before this? OK. Um, so if we read from verse 19 onwards of John 20, Jesus has appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. Um, and he comes to them. He stands in their midst. He says, peace be with you. He shows them that he's truly resurrected. It's a bodily resurrection, that he's not just a spirit. Um, and then he says, uh, from verse 21 onwards, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. OK, so uh, what is the context here in which Jesus is saying uh, you can forgive or not forgive? What are those two verses, 21 and 22, saying? OK, so uh, the Father had given Jesus authority, and now Jesus is giving authority to his disciples. OK, so what was Jesus sent for? The Father, why did the Father send Jesus? We know that Jesus was sent to die for our sins, right? Um, but uh, what was the purpose of that? To reveal the Father, OK? To make a way for us to be restored to the Father. And how are we restored to the Father? Through Jesus, through the cross, through his death and resurrection. So when Jesus was sent, he was sent to accomplish this work. And Jesus was preaching the kingdom of God and displaying the kingdom of God right up to the time that he went to the cross. OK, so we are also sent in the same way to preach the kingdom of God, to declare that sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. But the response that people give is up to them. Right? So the power to declare forgiveness to people is in our hands. We have the power to preach the gospel, to share this message that uh, there is forgiveness in Christ. But the response of the people will determine whether their sins are forgiven or not. OK? So that is one aspect. We are sent like Jesus was sent. Uh, the second thing is receive the Holy Spirit. So we go in the power of the Holy Spirit. We go as agents of God to represent Jesus Christ before people. Okay, so um, let's just turn uh, to Matthew 18. Okay, we'll read verses 15 to, uh, 15 to 20. Matthew 18 verses 15 to 20.
Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to the, hear the church, let him be to you like a brethren, like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Okay, so uh, the first aspect of forgiveness is in preaching of the gospel. Uh, so when we preach the gospel, we offer people the opportunity to be forgiven. Uh, if they reject the gospel, they have chosen to not receive that forgiveness. Uh, and if we read when Jesus sends out the disciples, he says, if they do not uh, welcome you, what do you do? Do you try and force them to accept the gospel, or what do you do when you go from one place to another preaching the gospel? He sends out his disciples, right, in twos to go out and share. So what is our response when people don't receive the gospel? Yeah, so we dust the, we basically shake off the dust from our feet and we move on, which is meaning to say that you have chosen to reject. And so I've done my work. I'm leaving you to be judged by God. OK, so that is one sense in which we have the power to declare forgiveness and to declare judgment. OK, the second aspect is what we just read in Matthew 18 here. Uh, this is within the body of Christ, okay, uh, where there is disagreement between uh, two people. We try to address it between the two people. We go to the larger body of the church. And if that person is still unwilling to accept correction, then we treat them as someone who is no longer part of that body of believers. But this is something that is given as collective authority to the church. Uh, so it says here, um, verse 18 says, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. This is very similar to the verse in John 20. Uh, if we read it in the original language, it actually is whatever you bind on earth has been bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth has been bound, uh, has been loosed in heaven. Meaning to say that you are just doing what has already been uh, done in heaven, what God has done in heaven, you are executing on earth. Okay, so God has actually bound, God has actually loosed, and you are executing that in this context, okay, in this uh, context of somebody sinning. Uh, and so it's saying when you agree as a church on something like this, then you are executing the will of God. OK, so I am there with you. I am leading you to act in a certain way. OK, does that make sense? So we are agents of Christ. Uh, and as a body of Christ, we can make certain judgments against sin uh, in agreement when we come into agreement with each other because we believe that Christ is present with us. Is that clear? So it's not as an individual that I can declare that you are not forgiven, but as a body of believers coming in agreement about a certain sin. OK. And then the third one is also a similar example, but this is a practical example. So Matthew 18 is just giving it to us in theory. Um, if we see uh, point C in under this question, it's mentioning the issue in the Corinthian church where there is sin in the church, and uh, Paul tells the church to put this out of their fellowship because he is continuing to walk in sin. And if they allow that to stay in the church, the rest of the church is going to be corrupted. 
Okay, so um, the point of putting that person out of fellowship of the church is to bring them to repentance. So even when we are passing this judgment against sin, our ultimate goal is that the person would repent, not that that person will be condemned uh, or that person uh, will feel this uh, sense of shame or um, judgment. Okay, the point of that de declaration of you are you have sinned and what you've done is wrong is to then give them the opportunity to repent. And that example is given in the Corinthian church. Um, so does this make sense? Any questions? All good? Yeah? OK. Um, the next one is three days and three nights. Uh, so we see in Matthew 12, 40, uh, that Jesus says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Um, now, there's this big question of how does Jesus' death to resurrection count as three days to three nights? Because we, the way we usually celebrate it is Good Friday and Easter, right? So Good Friday, you have Friday night. Saturday night, that's two nights, right? So even if we say the whole of Friday, the whole of Saturday, somehow Sunday morning, maybe three days, but we, we can only count two nights. So how can we account for these three days and three nights that Jesus mentions uh, in Matthew 12? Uh, there are two explanations that are given here. Uh, we'll just look at both of these. So John 19.31, let's just turn, we'll read these passages here, yeah, just to help us, John 19.31. Someone can read that for us. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Okay, so uh, John 19.31 talks about this being a high Sabbath. Uh, which may be different from uh, the regular Sabbath, and we look a little bit more at what that means. Um, okay, and this we see also in John 7.37, the same high Sabbath that is talked about, uh, the last day of the feast, the last and greatest day of the festival. So uh, the feast of the Passover and the feast of uh, unleavened bread uh, they were supposed to be uh, celebrated on the first month of the year, the month of Nisan. And the 14th day was the preparation day for the Passover. So if we look at uh, starting from the 14th day, you can look at that first table that is there. Um, the 14th day of Nisan was the preparation day. And that's when the Passover began. Uh, and if we look at the Jewish day and night, it the day began in the evening, right? So it began from 6 p.m. the previous day, and it would go into 6 p.m. the next day. So that would be considered as one day, uh, one full day, according to Jewish uh, custom. Okay, so uh, the Sabbath would begin at 6 p.m. on Friday rather than in the morning, Saturday, or 12 a.m. on Saturday. It would be, uh, begin at 6 p.m. on Friday. That would be their Sabbath day till 6 p.m. Uh, on the Saturday. So we count that 14th day of Nisan, the preparation day, uh, as the day when Jesus had his uh, supper. That would have been a Wednesday. OK, so he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane on Wednesday. Uh, on Thursday morning, he is crucified in the morning at 9 a.m. Uh, and he stays in on the cross till 3 p.m. Uh, but he's buried in the tomb before 6 p.m. that day. And uh, the Jewish Friday begins from 6 p.m. So Sabbath begins from 6 p.m. on that Thursday uh, evening. The Jewish Friday, sorry, begins uh, on that Thursday evening at 6 p.m. So that's considered as the first day. So we're saying here that Jesus was crucified on Thursday morning. 
uh, based on this whole thing of um, the high Sabbath, okay, where Friday is the high Sabbath and Saturday is the weekly Sabbath. So the normal regular Sabbath would have been the, uh, the Saturday, but the high Sabbath was the last day of the festival. And so that was the day uh, that they say that we can't uh, take the body of the, we can't have these bodies hanging on the cross on a high Sabbath. Okay, um, so Friday is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It begins uh, on that Thursday evening and then ends on Friday evening. Okay, so that is the second night that Jesus is uh, in the tomb. Saturday is the Sabbath. Uh, again, beginning on Friday 6 p.m., ending on Saturday 6 p.m. That's the third night. And on Sunday, Jesus is raised from the dead. Okay. Um, any questions? Is that a little confusing? Okay, so the only thing here is because of the high Sabbath and the weekly Sabbath, instead of considering Saturday as the Sabbath, we are saying that Friday was the, Sab was the Sabbath that is mentioned here in John because it talks about a high Sabbath. So that means Jesus was crucified on a Thursday rather than on Friday. Okay? So that is one explanation. The other explanation is that uh, we look at each night and day as one whole, like we count that as one day. So uh, on Thursday, uh, Thursday, that Jewish Thursday begins on Wednesday at 6 p.m. That's the preparation day. Uh, Jesus has his last supper okay, in, uh, on Thursday. And he's arrested. On Friday, he's crucified. Okay. And then he's buried before 6 p.m. So that's considered as the first day because he's buried before 6 p.m. He dies before 6 p.m. So that when Thursday to Friday is considered as the first day and night. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's the first day and night. Then he's in the tomb on Friday uh, from uh, Thursday, 6 p.m. Uh, sorry, from Friday 6 p.m. to Saturday 6 p.m. That's the second night of his death. Uh, and then from Saturday evening to Sunday morning is the third day of. So we're considering that 6 p.m. till whichever the next day as one day and night. Okay. So those are two possible explanations. Uh, so the conclusion here is also important. We are not looking at this as this is a definite explanation. These are just possibilities for ways to explain. But the important thing is that Jesus died and was raised. Okay, These are just ways to understand how we get those three days and three nights. Any questions or confusion about those two ways of looking at it? OK. All those online also. OK, uh, the next few ones, uh, we have two short ones. So we'll just look at that quickly. And then I wanted to do this group discussion. Um, we may just only have time for that today. Um, but yeah, and then we'll have to do maybe an hour next week. Uh, but we'll just, yeah, we'll see how far we get today. So 1 Corinthians 13. Um, we see at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, it says, uh, when the perfect has come, uh, tongues will end and prophesy, uh, prophecies will end. Okay, And so some people consider that the spiritual gifts are no longer for today because it talks about this time of perfection, when there will be no need for tongues, when there will be no need for uh, the use of uh, prophecy and other spiritual gifts. Uh, so let's just turn to 1 Corinthians 13. We look at that in the context of what uh, Paul is talking about. OK, if someone can just read for us from uh, verse 11 to 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away child, childish things. Verse 12, 
for now we see in a mirror dimly but then face to face now i know in part but then i shall know just as i also am known was 13 and now abide faith hope love these three but the greatest of these is love okay thank you so um bef just before this section from verses 8 to 10 he's talking about prophecies will cease tongues will be uh, still knowledge will pass away uh, and then he says when completeness comes what is in part will disappear um but that completeness is to come if we uh, from what we just read is when we will see christ face to face and right? uh now we see only a reflection as in a mirror then we shall see face to face uh so it's at christ coming that there will no longer be a need for the spiritual gifts so when he's talking about this perfection it's that final day of us being uh being with christ that's when we will truly see the kingdom realized we will see, uh, truly see all of uh all of heaven come on earth right uh, and so it's not talking about gifts uh, ending at our present time because we have not reached that time of perfection right do you all think we've reached a time of perfection no right we all continue to see we see death we see sadness we see uh, sin we see sickness all of that uh, so it's at this time of perfection that there will be no longer a need for gifts so until that time of perfection comes the gifts will continue to be in the church uh, to be exercised for the benefit of the body and uh, to be witnesses for christ okay uh, can women be in fivefold ministry uh we won't read these passages ephesians 4 8 to 11 and matthew 4 4 um but the word used is man and so uh is our interpretation that only men can be in these offices um no because that word man is just used to refer to humanity right so it can be a woman or a man who is given uh who's called to be an apostle a prophet an evangelist a pastor a teacher okay uh it's just that the word uh, in greek says man right uh it's translated as man in into english but it refers to humanity it refers to either male or female okay the fivefold ministry is the apostle prophet evangelist pastor teacher uh which uh is like our offices that are given uh in the church yeah i think you all will learn that second and third year you all will do each of those things okay so um we are not going to do head covering and headship because we already covered that right in class Uh, so we won't discuss that question um let's okay let's just uh, break up into groups and do can women teach the word okay uh, if you all have already read this in the time that we had then you all can just go straight into discussion uh, but if you all still have to read it i'll just give you all a few minutes to read it and discuss in groups uh, what is talked about here and we'll come back and uh, just share so um i'll do the breakout rooms online as well so we're just discussing uh, the question on page 42 can women teach the word um just for us to read those read what's given in our notes and um uh, come to a conclusion about what scripture's teaching is on that uh for those online i'll just start the breakout rooms uh we'll just have about i think 10 minutes or maybe let's just do 7 minutes uh so please get into your discussion quickly and uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit about what we discussed in our groups uh 
Okay, I'll just start the groups online. So please join your group uh, when the pop up comes on the classroom on Meet. Sorry.
those of you online, we are able to complete your discussion. Yes, okay, great. Um, okay, good job, thank you. I think the in-person students are just finishing up. Okay, anyone wants to share what was your conclusion on that question and um, why you all came to that conclusion? Sister, can I say something? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, sister, see, that there are women in the Old Testament that, that is in uh, Deborah, Esther, and uh, in the New Testament also there are women with Jesus, especially Mary Magdalene. She was uh, with Jesus till the end, and she was the one who uh, seen the resurrected Jesus first, and she went and told the apostles. I think what Paul says is about the married women to keep quiet in the church and uh, to take the husband's permission. So it was uh, during culture during that time. So the church has grown and uh, and according to Lucy said Galatians three twenty eight, you know we have that neither male nor female, everybody is equal in the eyes of God. Oh, okay. So, yeah, and anybody, Sam, would like to add something, anyone from my group? Go ahead, please. Yeah, I think um, I, I joined a little late because uh, I'm actually in Mangalore. Uh, so uh, as, uh, when we're in the breakout rooms, I think what I was just saying is before we um, when we're talking about this subject, before we go to the specific passages that Paul writes uh, in First Corinthians and Second Timothy, uh, where he's ex explicitly writing about women keeping silent, I think before we we you know go to those passages, we need to broaden the picture throughout Scripture. What do we see? Mm -hmm. And what we see is God has used women. Uh, we see in the Gospels in Jesus' ministry that he you know first spoke to women after he got resurrected and we see in paul's ministry team that he had many women um and he gives thanks to them and uh, you know their apostles so uh, i was just saying that before we attack those passages just to broaden the picture first and then we can go to those specific passages and uh kind of give our perspective and interpretation okay Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sister Gertrude and Sam. Um, it's important, like we talked about, uh, when we are interpreting difficult passages, that we uh, don't interpret, I mean, we never interpret scripture without taking into account what the rest of scripture is saying. But especially in such cases, um, we understand our conclusion should be based on all of scripture first informing how we read the passage. So normally what we'll do is we take a passage, we understand the context, then we look at the rest of scripture. Um, but here we know that this is something that is a little difficult to understand. And so we look at, okay, what does all of scripture first say about women? And then, okay, if scripture says this about women, that uh, God was already using women in the Old Testament, that Jesus uh, accepted women as disciples, which was actually very, very countercultural uh, to have women disciples. Um, 
and Jesus appeared to women first uh, when he was resurrected. Um, if all of that happened, then how do we understand what Paul is saying here? So we know that uh, the rest of scripture definitely doesn't uh, teach that women are not to be part of uh, ministry or to uh, serve God in this role of teaching. Um, is anyone else wanting to share something? Online or in person? The anointing and the spiritual gifts, what is there is the same. There is no disparity between uh, receiving it because if you're a male it's different I think and what Paul uh, primarily identifies here is about you know a woman having uh, to be submissive only in a, in a house it is not very specific in the church as such so a uh, male can only have a, a, what you call like a, it's like a responsibility it's not like an authority that he has over a woman mm. but where we were actually personally stuck in a group is like a, at the verse where it says in um, Timothy, First Timothy, uh, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. So, okay, that's, um, where we were. that's what. Sorry, that's where we were stuck because okay. First Corinthians we understood the concept in the context in the culture in which he spoke. Okay, but only in uh, First Timothy two eight to fifteen. Two uh, verse twelve, right? to teach or to assume authority over a man. OK, so we'll uh, just address that before we close. Uh, was anyone else who want to share online? Um, or anyone else here at class? This, uh, this you are, see the Galati chapter 3 verse uh, 28. This uh, verses say, There is a name Jew and Greek, there is a name Bo born for free, there is a Nick male and female, for you are all the all in Christ Jesus. And uh, Roman 12, this says, You are the uh, Jesus Christ of one body. Mm. So uh, emphasizing the equality of men and women, there's no uh, difference in terms of our position in Christ, uh, right? You were going to add something, sorry. No, these human and males on Jesus Christ of one body is uh, equal, is a preaching. What's that, sorry? Jesus, uh, human and female is uh, one body of Jesus Christ, is uh, human preachings. Okay, okay. So uh, both women and men can uh, preach about Jesus Christ, right? Um, so uh, why does Paul uh, talk about this specifically about women? Uh, I don't permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet, right? Uh, so one thing, like we looked at in our notes, is uh, the first aspect of within a husband-wife relationship, uh, not assuming authority over the man, which is uh, what he talks about in the second half. Um, but the first half of I do not uh, permit a woman to teach. Um, now, if we look at uh, this is not in your notes, uh, but I'm just going to add some background. Um, if we look at the context, women were not really educated in the law in Jewish custom. OK, so that was it was very, very rare for women to actually be knowledgeable about the scriptures, about the Torah. But it was very common for men as they were growing up when they were children to be taught the uh, Torah. So they were well versed in scriptures. And if we read uh, in this context in First Timothy, uh, there were false teachers who were coming in and targeting women, especially because women lack knowledge. OK, so what uh, Paul is actually saying, if we read the previous verse, verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. So he's not saying a woman shouldn't 
should actually what he's saying is advocating for them to learn but first learn before you're going to teach okay so uh, don't because these false teachers were targeting women because women didn't know the scriptures and uh, they were using that against them Paul is saying learn in submission learn in quietness and don't too quickly be uh, be um, or, to, or too quickly assume the position of a teacher okay uh, so that is the context uh, so reading it within the context of the rest of first timothy as well as in the context of the early church where false teaching and heresies were coming in uh, this is paul's encouragement women learn first before you uh, before you think about going into a position of teaching okay is that a satisfactory answer yeah okay um so we will end here and um i think we'll have to just address these last few questions next week um but thank you all for being here i, th I think next week we'll just need to do a one hour so maybe we'll start with the second hour instead of doing the first hour uh, we won't meet then. We'll meet in the second hour and then we'll do our third hour as well. Okay. Thank you all.